Welcome back to God's Business, where I interview the top Christian entrepreneurs, influencers, and thought leaders on how you can build not just a good business, but God's business, where he is the multiplier of your success. If you're watching on YouTube, then congratulations. That's where you get to see all of our guests' beautiful faces. I say guests, not just, just me, even though my hair is looking pretty fly right now. I just got it done in Malaysia. Go all the way back to the U.S. Yeah, you can also ring the bell after you subscribe that gives you access and information on when we're actually dropping new videos as well as we're on every single podcast platform so if you're on those platforms you're going to want to subscribe as well as leave us a rate and review so that we can hear the feedback from the show but if it's been impactful we would absolutely love that and would be super appreciative if you help us reach more people sharing the episodes reviewing the episodes all of it helps get the mission and vision out there of what god's doing on the earth through business owners specifically. As you guys know, that this is all about the fact that we have business owners over here, we have Christians over here, and a lot of times they those two things don't really get along that well. There's not a great place in the church for it, yet this is a place where we have no compromise. Inside of business, you're going to hear phenomenal business tactics today, as well as inside of faith, where we don't have to hide any of those things, but we're actually prospering in those two things and are seeing what does God say about these areas. And today, I have a phenomenal guy who became a professional football player, scored touchdowns in the NFL after not even playing when he was in school, like they're all throughout high school. Imagine going to a pro sport and not even playing in the times when everyone else is out there getting after it. Afterwards, found himself with a few hundred thousand dollars in his bank account, going completely flat broke as the average person does, but showed that he wasn't average through making these core decisions that you're going to see that you're going to be able to implement as well that allowed him to go out there now build a multi-million dollar company, discover Jesus, have him and his wife and his daughter be led to Jesus through a certain series of events that you're going to hear about. And throughout that has built a phenomenal company, Superhuman. So very excited to have my great friend here, Mr. John Madsen. John, what's up, dude? Grateful to have you on God's Business. Happy to be here, man. Real happy to be here. Thanks for uh, having me on your show. Yeah, dude. I, we're, we're a part of a mastermind together called Wellspring, and, and you're just out here in Austin, and we sat down and were able to have coffee, and I was able to hang out with you and your wife, which is just so cool to see. You guys are a power couple dynamic working together inside of business. I think that'd be even a cool place to start for some of the people out there that maybe don't work with their spouse. What was that like? Because I know that you guys didn't always do that in the past, what is it like working together with your spouse in a normal day to day? And how is it, how does it differ compared to how it was before? Yeah, man. So my wife, she has been a powerhouse for as long as I've known her. When I was in Salt Lake city, she was a news anchor on TV. And so I, I always joke around that I'm, I'm a powerful manifester. And I saw her on the television doing her news anchor stuff. And I'm like, I'm going to know that girl someday. And so, uh, Anyways, like she was, she was excellent at that. But then a little backstory on her, she has worked with other startups. She was uh, essentially a COO to, for a major tech company and wow. did that for many years, built, built up the organization. And then ultimately was feeling a little bit of overwhelm. That season had kind of passed for her. And so she's like, you know what? Uh, I'm going to come over to Superhuman, which was the company that I founded. And she was essentially just kind of going to look under the hood and maybe work a little bit, do a couple things. But like her personality, as soon as she opened up the hood, there was like a whole operational system that she could go to work on. And so uh, about a year ago, she was, she was full time as co-founder then as, as co-owner into Supra. And we really had to figure out like what that dynamic was because our personalities are very different in certain ways. We're both like high drivers, high achievers, but I'm more maybe visionary type of CEO where I see the bigger picture. I get excited about marketing and sales. And I also, of course, care about fulfillment and reputation and, and brand. But uh, my focus is so one dimensional on trying to create this massive movement that's just on my heart that she was kind of that other piece, which, you know, you and I would probably call the integrator. And the amount of, uh, I, I guess, just increase in all capacities that I was able and we were able to together to achieve over the past 12 months was incredible. So I give her all the credit in the world because she's a genius at what she does. 
And uh, I was then able to just focus on what I do best. And, you know, then we had to learn out, learn how to maybe compartmentalize business a little bit, because as you probably know, and, and some of you listening know, then it was like, we're having business conversations. We're in Slack channels all day together, you know, running this organization and we get home and it's like, okay, where's my wife at? Are you wife? Are you, you know, co-owner? Are you mom? Are you husband? You know what I mean? And so that was, that was difficult. I think that that took us probably a good four or five months to really get our handle on, on, you know, the, the differences of roles within the company and then going back to the household. And would you say that you guys already kind of had a good grip on what your strengths were? I know when Amanda and I first started together, the tough part was we didn't really have a career before or something that we had done. So I was actually trying to be like that integrator, back end support system. I thought my wife's hot. I was selling a fitness product. Like they have to buy from the hot chick over me. So like, let's put her out there. And, and we really realized that that was like strenuous on her. And then I was garbage. But we, I was kind of crappy at sales too because I'd never done it before. So I didn't really know. And so we had a flip. And for you guys, it seems like you guys kind of went right into it. Were you able to recognize what your core roles were or did you have some overlap at first? And then, you know, that, that had to have been a tough transition as well. Like having someone who wasn't really involved with your business come in as well. What was that dynamic like? Yeah, so I've always been the face of the fitness company. And so it, it's mostly, I, I would say at this point, we're probably 70% male, 30% female in, in our private one-on-one -on -one coaching. Um, the face has been mine. So that was like already decided. She wasn't coming in trying to be, although she has a much more beautiful face than I do. She wasn't <laughs> trying to come in and, and be the face. At that point, she had spent, eight years in a, in a, in the corporate world. So had this corporate structure that, uh, I had no idea. Right. Like I was like, I imagine, was imagine if she would have like came from just news anchor though. I feel like she would have probably, there would have been a rival there. Cause that was, yeah. she was the face, right? She's always on TV. She's the one who's speaking. She has an awesome voice for people that don't know. You find her probably through John's Instagram, but it's like, uh, it, the dynamic, she's very dynamic. She does have a great style, right? She's got a presence. She's got a unique voice, all of those things. But probably that corporate experience probably helped you out a ton. It was like laid the, fr the framework for you guys. Yeah, man. I was like, you know, just little things. I would give out titles, right? Just like an entrepreneur. Like I've never had a real job. I went from, you know, when I was in college, my dad's buddy had a used car lot. Like, and I'm talking like used car lot, $600 down, 200 a month, you know, no credit check yeah. type of car business. And wow. uh, so I would sell cars and just get paid cash every time I sold a car. And I wasn't that good at it, but it would just like, you know, I, I was better than most of the guys he had. So that was like a summer job, uh, before, you know, in between me playing football, then I'll go to the NFL. And so it's like, I go from like zero, zero corporate experience, go to the NFL when I'm cut from the NFL, open up my own gym. Cause I'm like, nobody's ever going to tell me what to do. I'm going to do it my way. And even if I fail, it's going to be better than someone telling me what to do. So I did that for so many years and nobody telling me what to do except for my clients and uh, bank accounts sometimes. But uh, long story short, like I would just give out titles as my company started to scale. Um, I would be like, oh, yeah, I don't care what you call yourself. Call yourself whatever you want. Like your pay is your pay. Doesn't really matter to me what you call yourself. And so I had directors. Ever. Like I had everyone was like a director and there was like bonuses and this and that. And so she came in and looked and she's like, OK, you have this director like. What do they do? And I'm like, whatever they tell me to do. I mean, whatever I tell them to do, right? And so there was no yeah. SOPs, no OKRs, no nothing. And she was like, I have to fix this. And so at first it was kind of like this butting of heads because she's, you know, she she uh, is a powerful woman too. And I took it as like criticism for what I built. And it was a multi-million dollar company at that point. And then I, I had to submit to this understanding that I actually didn't know a lot about uh, business and structure and operations. And when I fully just kind of let her run with it, my life got better. The company, like the company is now set up for massive scale. And so uh, once again, man, like it was, it was hard at first, but it ultimately was like the best thing that could have happened. Yeah. And you guys like, there's obviously Christians, right? There's like 2 billion people that identify as a Christian or more. And then, but a lot of them maybe never had their own experience, right? They like grew up in a church. Maybe they'd be like even religious because they just do whatever they've been told to do. 
And that's, there's some benefit to that, right? Maybe you don't make terrible mistakes in your life or you don't kill someone because you're like, I shouldn't do that. Yet it, it takes having that like personal experience. So for you guys, what was your personal experience like where you were like, I'm a Christ follower, like your own experience and being a couple, were you guys a couple prior to that experience? Cause that'd be a very interesting dynamic to go through because, you know, a man and I, like we met in ministry school. Mm. So it was like that, that value, we had already had our own personal experience, which I'm grateful for. Cause she grew up in a Christian church. I never had been to church. I thought Catholics drank a lot of alcohol and Christians didn't. So I told people we were Catholic my whole life. Like that's, <laughs> I was like, I think we're Catholics. My dad drinks a ton. So for you guys, what was your, that, that moment where it wasn't just a religion or something like that, but your actual encounter with Jesus and who had it first and were you guys already Christians before you started dating or what, what did that look like? Yeah, man. So, uh, ironically, I grew up in Salt Lake city, Utah. So my, or my, my first real experience with God or religion was all encapsulated in a Mormon type of culture. LDS. Is, is culture. that where you, is that what you grew up in? Like actually going to like, like in Utah, I was like, my family was like the family at school that was like, they're not Mormon or they're not. Oh, wow. And so, um, you know, like I didn't notice it as much as my sister did because I was an athlete. So I had, I had tons of friends that are Mormon friends today. I have tons of LDS friends, but, um, my only experience in any church was like, Hey, John, you want to go to church with me? And I'm like, okay. So maybe a half dozen times when I'm 10 to 14 years old. I go to church with one of my, one of my, you know, teammates on the basketball team or something with his parents. And so I sit in an LDS church, but like my, my, my parents and me and my sister were not LDS. And although my cousins were, so I have a lot of cousins that went on like missions and did the whole, the LDS thing, but for, I just got born into this family that wasn't right. And so, um, there was this pursuit to get like, to get us into the church multiple, multiple times. And so like, I don't know if it's just my personality or what, I'm just like reject, right? Yeah. And so my, my, my relationship with religion my whole life was like, I'm not Mormon, therefore I'm not religious, therefore, you know, I don't even know if I believe in God. And so, yeah. you know, going through all the sports and stuff, I used to, I used to say, you know, before we went out to play a game on Saturday or Sundays in the NFL, you know, the whole team would get down on a knee and pray and I'd go through the motion because I'm like, hey, you know, God, you know, help me uh, not look like an idiot out here or score a couple <laughs> touchdowns. But I'm like, yeah, I had no relationship with God. In fact, I would I was say I was very agnostic. I'm like, I don't know if God exists or doesn't exist. I'm kind of in the middle, no relationship. And so this was like, this was my entire life. The first time I really acknowledged that there was an immaculate creator was I was 35 years old and we had our first child. And we had a lot of battles with infertility and, uh, you know, our baby was born through IVF. And so when I, when I finally got this miracle baby with me and my wife, I, yeah, I remember her opening her eyes and I'm just like, man, there is, there is a creator, but I kind of put that on the shelf, right? It was like two, two or three days where like, that's what I was thinking about. And wow. I just kind of put it on the shelf, go about my life. And, uh, you know, continue to do what, what we do business and try to win. And so, um, about a couple more years goes by and we wanted, we want a second child. And so we've thrown at this point, uh, you know, probably a hundred thousand dollars at IVF treatments, different doctors, different stuff. Nothing's really technically wrong other than we're, you know, we started late and now we're nearing 40 years old, but hypothetically we should be able to conceive, um, you know, there's nothing that's like a doctor saying it won't happen for you. And so I'm working out at uh, a gym that's right around the corner that the company or the gym is called Glory Games. And the owner I know is a big time believer. I still don't think about it, but on their Instagram profile, like it's like Glory Games, all glory goes to God. So, you know, why that's relevant is because out of the out of the blue, I'm in the squat rack, I have like 350 pounds, I'm about to you know, squat for five or six reps. And I'm sitting there in like a three minute rest period. And I just hear this voice probably like I would say for the first time in my life that I was like, that was, that was super weird. And it was, it was God to me saying, you've done everything, everything you've done except for give it to me. And I, I was like, I got chills. 
on my body. I literally had a tear kind of drop out of my eye. And I'm looking around because I was just kind of like shook in that moment because it was out of the ordinary. And so I unrack the weights and I just walk out of the gym. And I, I, when I saw Nineveh, I was like, babe, like this is, this is what happened at the gym. I'm like, I text the owner of the gym to, and ask him if he'd take me to church the very next Sunday. And I'm like, when I right. text him, I was like, dude, Caleb, this is weird. I've never asked this to anybody in my entire life. But uh, next time you go to church, man, will you take me? And so he does. And uh, me and my wife just start going to church, right? I'm a person that I would say I'm very logical in the way that I think. And so I had never read the Bible at all. Like I'd seen passages that maybe I'd like, be like, oh, that's cool. Like, you know, I see a picture on Instagram or something. But I never had a Bible that was mine and I never actually read it. And so um, from that day, I started reading like from, from, front to back. Cause I'm like, I, you know, if I'm going to read something, I'm going to read from yeah. front to back. Right. So, you know, I, I start getting into like Leviticus and stuff and I'm like, what is going on? Like, I'm, I yeah. don't know how to decipher <laughs> any of this stuff, but I heard God and I was, I was committed to like going to church and I just, it just made me feel something. Right. And so long, very long story short, that was probably two years ago. And, uh, I just kept getting connected to these these kingdom warriors, right? And, and the right people at the right time. And so uh, a couple, I meet a couple people and then eventually I end up into the Wellspring group with you guys, which completely took our faith to another level. And so ultimately last October, uh, I think it was October, maybe September, I got baptized for the first time and my wife got rebaptized. She had she had been uh, a Christian before, like she got baptized when she was 18, but then she was, you know, throughout our marriage, like we were not, we were not Christian or uh, religious at all until this point. Yeah. And so we're very, we're, we're very new in this pursuit, but it's been about two years since that moment I was in the gym and it just like shook my world. That's so wild, man. And when I look at that, what was the dynamic like in the house? Did it just kind of fit when you were like, this is what I want to do. Did she just go, all right, that sounds, that sounds great. Like, let's do it. And did she kind of just fit right in with that? Or was there any type of like pushback? Cause obviously there's that feeling as well of there's times where things just don't go the way we want to, you know, like, like that's, it's easy to get upset at God for what's going on in our life, especially if we don't understand like what the word says or, or what his intentions are. And I would assume that, you know, that's, that also would hurt her, like the experience that she had was, how did that go when you were like, this is what I want to go do. Did, you went to that first church service, you started reading, I'm assuming you kept going deeper and deeper and deeper. Was she just like right there following suit? She was all about it, man. Like she, like, if you asked her, she would, she would tell you, like, I was waiting, like I was waiting for, yeah, yeah. for you to, to go down this path. Although it was never said. Or maybe I missed the hints yeah. in, the, in, yeah, yeah. The, in the, the previous eight years, but it was not something that, you know, we, we ever pursued or even considered like walking into uh, a church. And so, you know, we're, we're living in Scottsdale now. So that was a big change too. Like if I think back to when I decided to move to Scottsdale, it was like, I knew I needed to move. Right. And so there was another moment was like, I back then, see, I didn't know how to decide for God's voice or if it was just like my own intuition or, you know, what it was. But like I, w I was in Salt Lake City and this was two and a half years ago. And I'm like, I have to move. I have to move. We're going to Scottsdale. She's like, yes, we've been in Utah so long. And so we moved to Scottsdale and then all that stuff takes place. Right. And we go on this journey that like neither of us were expecting. And so if you asked her, she would be like, I, I, I had been waiting for this although it was something that was never really said. So as soon as we started going, you know, she was in, she was in her Bible. We were both studying together. We were going to church and then we were getting around the right people. And so it was just like one little bread crumb, crumb after the other, man. And it's been a, a magical ride. Yeah. I would say in, inside of faith one, there's a, there's a stat that says that if a man makes a decision in the household, like a faith decision, there's an 81% chance that everyone else in the household will make it. Guys are more like hard headed. So I think it, it's around like 17 to 19% of the, if the woman in the house does it. So they're already, I feel like they're really open. They already want it to happen. 
but the guys are obviously way more hard headed. If the if the kid does it, it's a one, it's a single digit, like eight nine percent. So let's say if your daughter was the first one to go, oh, I'm going to church. Then there's a eight nine percent that you're going to go and and then going to go because of it. And so it's cool, like that. I mean, that's for me, like King's Brotherhood. The reason I'm going after the men is because I know if they're healthier, man, they have an eighty one percent influence over their entire like family below them. Whereas if you get the kid or even the wife, those are all phenomenal. They're still greater percent than if they didn't. But man, it's like there's something about that. And and I also look at the way that you guys like approached it. Timing is such an interesting thing. Like do, when you look back, do you see where God was kind of pushing you forward throughout the years? I, I remember I was in fourth grade, bro, and someone gave me a Bible. And I still remember that. And my mom was like, it's super complicated. So I was like, oh, whatever. So I chucked it. And then like, I ended up meeting a kid who was a Christian, and one day I just feel like I should call this kid. And I was driving to the very place that he already was at, and I was like, "Let's hang out." And then, like, boom, I get saved. Like, met mm-hmm. with these kids. So, for you, was there like a? Could you look back and see that God had been kind of prepping you for that moment the whole time? Yeah, man. Like, it, it's it's crazy to me now looking back at my life through that lens to be because again, like, I thought one of the things that I had, one of my biggest realizations that really like, you know, broke me down at the first wellspring where I was like literally on my knees was, was uh, this realization that it wasn't all me, right? Like I, I'm not a person that lacks, con- like I, I don't lack confidence in, in what I do, right? I have a lot of courage. I have a lot of pursuit. And so um, when I, I decided like, we didn't even really get into this, but I ended up playing in the National Football League for the Raiders, and I I didn't play high school football. And so there was a there was any even a moment there was like okay I, I decided not to play high school football, and then uh, my basketball team that you know basketball I thought I was going to go play in the NBA. My basketball team goes one in thirty nine in my high school career, and so like nobody gets recruited. We're we're the worst team in the history of of Utah, and so I'm like. I remember just being like, why is this happening to me? Right? Like, why can't we win a game? And because we didn't win any games and I didn't get recruited, I go to junior college and I decide, like, I remember a, 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 the exact time period where I decided that I was going to play football. I'm walking across the, this uh, grassy area. And um, I just got told that I couldn't walk onto the basketball team because there was no spots. And my dad asked me, he's like, what are you going to do, son? And I said, like, I just voice." Let's go talk to the football coaches. You, you literally didn't play for three years. You skip, you skip probably the most important part, right? My parents were great. He's like, okay, let's do it. And so um, I go in there and bam, I, I decide to play football and then end up having this crazy backstory, scoring a couple of touchdowns in, a, in the National Football League. But as I look back, I'm like that. And, and in the moment at the wellspring at 9,000 feet, it was like, that wasn't all you. I've been here all along. And I'm just like, dude, shook in the moment again. And I just start to realize all those moments, man, like were orchestrated. And it was mm-hmm. like, dude, it was beautiful, but it was like, it, think about not having that for your whole life and then having it when you're, I'm, I'm 39 years old. So a uh, half of my life. Yeah, dude. And I, it reminds me of like, there's times where biblically God uses people that don't follow God for his own plan. And then also there's times where like a Joseph story where Joseph had a vision, was following God, but then slavery and and jail and all these things that then all of a sudden led him to the point where his father had died and all of his brothers that tried to kill him, they thought Joseph's definitely going to kill us now. He's second most powerful dude in the world, rules over us, and we tried to kill him and we sold him into slavery. And Mm -hmm. he looked at them and was like, oh, you think you sold me into slavery? But like, this was God's plan the whole time, right? And it was like this like journey of forgiveness, but also this recognizing of, oh, wow, looking back hindsight, now I can see that God was involved with every step of this. And it's crazy how blessing really foreshadow, like overshadows the negative side. I look at Job, I just finished reading it, uh, or kind of skipped, <laughs> to be honest. I, I read a lot of it and then I skipped to the end. I'm like, all right, what happens? And and the dude gets a, double anything he had ever had before. And when I read like the very end of it, it was like his years were long and like 
his life was better. And it was almost like that so much overshadowed, like this tiny little portion that everyone like freaks out about when it comes to Job. So I just think it's, when I look at your life, I, I pull out some of those core things that, that you talked about. Not even that, you know, scoring touchdowns in the NFL after not playing in high school, the thought of even being that good just like blows my mind. Like I just went boxing and I, I had a whole new respect for Jake Paul. I was yeah. like, bro, the thought of being a YouTuber to go box, like even an MMA fighter, I just thought if I were to box an MMA fighter right now, what would it look like? I, I would get my ass kicked, dude. Mm. Like a whole new respect. The fact that you went out after not playing football and somehow when everyone else is practicing their whole life for this and you were that skilled at it, was that weird? And when you look back, do you, do you almost wish that you put more like, was your work ethic there after you got into it to, to be able to become good? Do you feel like you could have been even better if you would have, like, exercised those skills even more? So I was, like, I played football in Little League from the time I was 10, and to, I stopped when I was in ninth grade, and I, I'm right after ninth grade. And the reason I stopped, like, if someone looks at me now, I'm, like, I'm 6'5", 240 pounds. But when I was a sophomore in high school, I was, like, 5'11", probably one 140. So just like stick thin and, you know, kind of tall. And uh, I went to the weight room for the very first time to, to actually go out for the high school football team. And nobody got cut back then. It's like, if you survive two a day, it's like you're on the team, right? And so all the kids that I played with from the time I was 10 years old was going through the same process as me. But we get to the weight room and uh, we're maxing out on bench press and 95 pounds, like, comes crushing down on my chest and I'm the only kid that I know of that can't bench press 95 pounds. And so my friends are laughing at me and, you know, in the moment I'm like, my confidence was completely shattered. And I look around and I'm, I'm looking at all these, you know, bigger guys and I'm like, dude, I'm going to get hurt. And so I had this fear and I, wow. I went home and I'm like, dad, I'm not playing football, but hear me out. Like, I want to get strong. I want to get like, I want to get bigger and stronger. Can you like help me work out? you know, because I was embarrassed. And so I ran into that insecurity and with, you know, it ultimately took me off the football field, but actually was the best blessing ever because it gave me time because I did still play baseball and basketball. It gave me a whole off season to dedicate to, to my strength and putting on size and what it did. Like I wanted to just like get my confidence back and not be the weakest kid in my class, but what it did dude, it like, I went from barely being able to dunk a basketball to being able to dunk 360. I got faster. So the athleticism that was built in the gym, I, I spent a lot of time there and, and I, I learned to love it. And so I had the work ethic and I had the athleticism after my body went through that kind of weird stage. So, um, you know, when I, when I got on the football field, though, I still wasn't great. Like when I made the team, I was afraid I was going to get cut in the junior college team. And uh, I ultimately had to redshirt because I was like, dude, this kid can't play. Like, I didn't know how to run routes well, but I was just an athletic kid at that point. And so the coaches saw this, this vision for me that's like, look, if you, if you dedicate yourself to this, there's no telling how far you could go because I did have like intangible height. Like I'm six foot five, I, I would put weight on. And so um, I had the size, I had the speed. Ultimately, it was up to me then how much I was going to dedicate myself to this craft. And so in a lot of ways, it was like everything, once again, like we just talked about, was set up for me to like in the moment, I was like, why is this happening to me? It didn't feel good. But like all, all those steps were laid out for me. And I just kept, dude, I just kept showing up, man. There were so many times I wanted to quit too, because I'm like, just like anybody else, there was, there was a lot of doubt in certain moments where I was like this, like I'm crazy for thinking that I can do this, right? But I showed up the next day and I showed up the next day and I showed up the next day and I just kept showing up and ultimately found myself in a, in a place that I, I believed in. But at multiple times, I was going to like shut that door and be like, I have no idea if it's going to work out or not. Have you drawn on that moment again? Because imagine if you went to theater or speech class or, you know, public speaking and that was the thing, like you went to a weightlifting session, which dude, I don't even think I could bench like 55 pounds. So, but I was also a hundred, I was 99 pounds my freshman year of high school. Yeah. So Just I was like, yeah, a little I, than me. bro, I was, I was like four foot 11 
Like I was like I was compared to you even then. Oh, bro, you were massive, like massive, massive. So I, I, I do experience those same feelings. Like I didn't even go to the gym until I moved out of San Diego because I didn't want to see anyone at the gym because if they saw, I wanted to be fit before I went to the gym, but I didn't know how to get fit without lifting the weights because I didn't even know how to use them. So I was like, man, so I had to leave town because I was like, dude, if I see anyone, exactly I'm- it. Dude, that's exactly it because I was like, I'm not going to take weight training class with any of you fools. Like I'm going to go get fit and then I'm going to show you. It's the same, yeah, yeah. It was the same, same thing in my head, dude, because I was, I was too embarrassed to do it there. I was just like, I'm going to go do it over here and then I'm, I'm going to come back. That was so has there been home. another time that's like that, like in a different area? Because all that was, was like, again, if it was speak public speaking and you didn't do it, you maybe would have been like, oh, I'm going to go figure out how to talk, right? Has there ever been another time where you're like, oh, crap, like maybe it's the public speaking since people would rather, people are more afraid of speaking publicly than dying. So they say that people would rather be the person in the coffin than the one reading the eulogy. Mm. Because it's that big of a fear for people. So did you ever go through that again where you have, because you have this confidence now, right? But you're confident because you've put in the, the effort and the reps in the gym that you're no longer not fit. Like you're no longer not strong. So it's like a competence confidence as well, which I think is, you know, needed. <laughs> like you can't just have confidence and like be freaking weak and I'll have this you, like delusion. I think my confidence comes from a, a unique place. I failed so many times and I feel like I've not won so many times that most people like fear this idea that they're going to fail, fail, which in my mind, it's, it's more, it's a little bit deeper than that. It's the fear of like judgment of like what that failure is going to look like to other people. And so for me, like, I just don't care that like that has been so far gone. Like I've, I put myself out there. I've lost so many times. And because mm -hmm. of that, I've won and gotten to places where people's like, I can't believe you've done that. And to me, it's just this, uh, it, it just stems from this, uh, this kind of not caring whether I get embarrassed or I, I suck at something. However, that had to be completely developed, right? And speaking about uh, public speaking, I was, a, I was a smart kid. Like I had 4.0s in, in high school and stuff. Maybe not smart. I just knew how to get good grades, right? Like I was, yeah. I'm not like the smartest person that a person's ever going to meet, but there's, there was this um, ability to get good grades very easily and know how to work my way around a system. So anyways, I'm, I'm going into business. Uh, my degree was gonna be in business, business. And there was a prerequisite that was public speaking. And so I go to this public speaking course one day and they, we get the syllabus. And so we're told that we have to, in order to pass this class, we're going to have to get up there and give this like hour long speech in front of the class. And this class is like, this was university now. So there was tons of people in the class. And in my head, I'm like, I'm not doing that. I'm not doing that. Right. And so I go to my counselor and I'm like, I'm going to, with I need to withdraw from this class. Like, what are my options? And they're like, well, you can't major in what you want to major. I'm like, well, where will my credits transfer? Cause I, I don't care about that. Right. Wow. And they're like, well, uh, economics is, is something that you can major in and it doesn't, there's no prerequisite of public speaking. I'm like, cool, just transfer my credits there and I'll major in economics. So I get out of the class because I was so afraid to public speak, changed wow. my major to economics, which I hated by the way, and ultimately got my degree in economics and, uh, did not public speak. And I hated public speaking for years and years and years and years. And I just wanted to avoid it and avoid it and avoid it and avoid it. And through business and just through, you know, kind of my ride, it's like, I kept getting put in places where I had to public speak. And I was just like, I, I, I got to a point where like the courage was, I had a little more courage than I had fear. So I would just do it and I would hate it. But now it's been multiple years where I kept putting myself in situations like that. I, I still don't, say that like i'm supremely excited people will ask me to speak like i had to speak at the mgm grand on grant cardone was on the stage and someone's like john you know they want you to speak i can get you in do you want to do it and i'm like yeah and then they uh they confirm and i'm like why did i say yes dude like why did i say yes and so like yeah that's still kind of my relationship with it but i just i've learned to lean into it man isn't that interesting that sometimes your destiny even because at this point you didn't know 
you're majoring in business and now you do business. There's these little things inside of us that when I look at a lot of athletes, especially ones that are not team athletes, a lot of their big thing is like they're so afraid. They they hate losing more than they like winning. This has been like a common study. And and so that drives them, right? But it's almost like this love-hate relationship where they like dislike it. In, In my sport of motocross, all the guys that talk about it now, they're like, I hated racing. (laughs) <laughs> because I hated losing, you know, it's like, yeah. it's like, but they loved winning, right? They love, oh, I loved when I was winning, but I didn't like racing. And it's weird that it's almost like this thing that we care about. So it's like, I always said, I didn't want to be a coach and I didn't want to be a speaker. And though I said it so many times that I almost like reverse attracted it, but it might've been because I like actually deep down inside, like had this weird connection with it. I don't know. There's something there with that, that, even with what you just said, you're now the spokesperson for your company. You grow the company through either content, video. You guys have a podcast. What's your guys' podcast name? So I have a podcast. It's called The Show with John Madsen. Nineveh has her own podcast, which is called I Am Nineveh. And then, yeah, man, like I, I'm now trying to really do the YouTube thing, which I had put on the, you know, just didn't really pay a lot of attention to the last couple of years. But podcast, I have 200 and 50 something episodes. So that was born about three years ago. And my business is highly reliant on content. And so it was, you know, I used to hate the camera. I used to feel weird if I was like, you know, doing a selfie or like, you know, doing a video in front of people. And it's just like, it's part of the business now. So uh, I just had to more like really, really lean into some of the stuff that I was very insecure about. And I think honestly, there's a difference because a lot of times like people want to just like, I look at insecurity as like a fork in the road. Right. And it's like, you can, you can go on this path, which I tried to do um, with getting away from public speaking and just withdrawing from the class. It's like, ah, I'm insecure about that. I'm going to go over here. Right. And ironically I had to end up at the same point. Um, But like insecurity in the weight room, it was like, I ran right into that. Right. Mm -hmm. I was supremely insecure by that one embarrassing moment. But it's like, I, I was like, I was so insecure. I needed to battle it. And so now I, anytime stuff like that comes up, I take, I, I seem to take that approach because I know that that is the thing that's going to build more confidence than any other thing. Like if I'm insecure about something, I need to go to work on that thing. And I think 99% of people would rather just like divert, not lean into it. And therefore they let it win, man. What do you think was the core thing when business started really working for you? Like, because I, I know you've had some business failures, so so touch on that. You talked about like you got you got out of the NFL, you had a certain amount of money, and and then it was gone, and and which is a common thing. But the common thing also isn't the the building up. What was the first? Do you remember when your first business breakthrough started happening? And what were what do you think were the core contributors before that? Because man, I get I get Christian guys, and there's times, man, where they're like, man, I prayed about this, and it's just too big of an investment for me. And and it always irks me, man, because I'm just like, just say you don't want to or you're afraid of it or something. But don't give me that because I'm like, when Jesus needed to pay taxes, he he mocked the disciples so hard. He said, let's go fish. I'm like, bro, mm-hmm. they literally were fishermen. They would know, hey, bro, it's going to take a while of fishing if we're going to pay taxes. But he catches one fish and pulls a gold coin out of the fish's mouth and tips the tax collector. It was way more money than what they owed. And I'm like, that's how he did it. He didn't really allow funds to be the thing that kept him from his destiny or dream. So for for you, what was the steps that may inspire some of the other guys to take those steps? And and what was that first moment of business breakthrough where you really saw the rise start happening? Yeah, man. So like when I played in the NFL, I played there for three, ultimately three years. And uh, I was supposed to be a high draft pick. And I broke my leg with three games to go my senior year. So once again, like it was like, I'm going to make a million dollars in three months as as a signing bonus to um, here's $5,000 in a plane ticket. Let's hope that you're as athletic (laughs) as you used to be because I I couldn't run for 10 months after I broke my leg. And uh, so I I get to Oakland as an undrafted free agent. And then I'm the only undrafted free agent that year that makes the actual roster there's like practice squad and then there's the active roster and so i was the only undrafted free agent to make active roster and i played you know in every game my my rookie season ultimately played 
three seasons, and then I was on a one-way plane ticket back home. So with all that being said and done, I made probably a 1.2 million over those three years um, in total salary. However, I was playing in California and getting taxed in every city that I played in. And so ultimately, like when I left, I had about $330,000. I remember swiping my ATM card as a 20, you know, six year old kid, have $330,000 in there and thinking to myself, like, dude, I'm like, I'm pretty rich. Like I have way more money than my parents. I'm like $330,000 still felt like a lot of money. So yeah. I buy a house in Arizona, put a hundred K down. So I'm like, okay, now I have like 200, 230,000. And then I start my first gym and I write a check for a hundred K with perf and all the equipment and stuff. And so I'm like, okay, now I have 130 K still way more money than, you know, it's a lot of money. Right. And then I start to realize that like my lifestyle is costing me 10 grand a month. And then my business expenses are another 10 grand a month. Right. So I'm like, now I'm losing 20 grand a month and I only have 130 left. And so I start to do the math and I'm like, dude, I'm going to run out of money real fast. Like I, I don't yeah. have any business sense at all. Right. I'm just like, if that, if I build it, they're going to come. That was my, that was my faith back then. Right. And so I had to learn some really hard business lessons because about 16 months after I opened that first gym was uh, a moment where I don't have problem sleeping, but I remember this night, it was like, I woke up and I was like, I got to shut the gym down. I got to file bankruptcy. I got to do all this stuff. I don't have enough money. And so, um, I, I got, I was training, you know, this, this woman and her husband was a lawyer. And so I was like, dude. Like, do I got to file bankruptcy? He's like, no, you don't owe anybody money. Like, this is all your stuff. We just got to get you out of the lease. And, uh, you know, that's it. And so in one weekend, I took all my equipment out there. I'm selling it for pennies on the dollar. And that was like a Friday. And I had already set up a deal with another buddy in his gym. It's like, hey, man, can I just rent some space for, from you for a little bit? I have some clients now. I just got to get rid of all this stuff. And so that was like my first big business failure. My money, like, went to zero. So I had zero and I'm like thinking to myself that I'm one of those idiot football players that everyone talks about that like was <laughs> this, you know, this long shot hero that everyone started to root for. And now I have zero and I'm like, dude. And then and I, what, and then what I went, year was this? Like, so this was, uh, this was 2010. Okay. So this is still a while. This is, yeah. There wasn't so, much. Like, Edu it wasn't like Alex Hermosi was out there with Jim Launch in 2010. Ed Alex was a child as well. And so it was like, because you think about it, I always ask people like, what's what's more, what costs more, ignorance or education? And you really yeah, think man. about it, like Alex's program was like 16 grand. And if someone like you would have just dropped 16 grand, it would have saved you like 120 grand. Dude, you know? and I did, like, but it took, me, it took me like until 2017. So yeah, yeah, that, exactly. that was the other thing is like, I had this, I had this like scarcity mindset at that point, like lost all my yep. money. Now I'm just like pinching pennies. I'm still in the gym, you know, just grinding it out, wondering what I did with my life. I'm watching, you know, friends that I went to college with that are in real estate, like, you know, driving nice cars and stuff. And now I'm the one that's like, dude, I'm like, I can't believe I squandered this opportunity, but long story short, 2017 comes and I did find out about Alex Hormozzi. And I did pay that 16 grand and that oh, was wow. the first time that I actually, I don't even know if I knew that. That's funny. Yeah, dude. It was the first time that I, I literally started making money in my gym for years. It was just like, you know, I made enough to live and, uh, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't, you know, eating Eggo waffles every day. I was like living an okay life, but I was like, I had no money in the bank. I, I was stressed every time the mortgage payment had to, had to come out. And so 2006, 2017, I saw an ad from Hormozzi, didn't know who he was, and ultimately uh, put it on a credit card and was like, this this better work. Like, I'm not, funny story, dude. I don't, I've not even told this story because I haven't even thought about it. So I'm, I start running ads, right? And back in the OG days of gym launch, Layla was doing the ads for the females. And so she actually, they were allowing everyone to use the ads that they made for people. Yeah. Right. And so they're like, just put this ad copy up, throw this out there and you're going to get $2 leads, $1 leads. And, uh, so I throw this ad up there and my wife, my wife is in the targeting demo. She doesn't know that I put this on a credit card. And so I'm at the gym one day and my, I get a text and she's like screenshot it's Layla's face. And she's like, who the F is this? 
because it's like an ad from me and it's Layla's face doing the ad. And I was like, babe, uh, I did this program and this is one of the owners of the program. And they told me to run this ad, but don't worry about it. It was 16 grand. I'm already making money because like <laughs> I started selling like, like that. Yeah. Dude. And so I did, that's how I got caught that I, you know, put that 16 K on a credit card because in my eyes back then, like there was no other solution. I finally swallowed that ego. I didn't care about the money. Like you said, I'm like, somebody knows how to do this. I'm going to, I'm going to figure it out from them. Yeah. And that, it's so wild because the original story just shows you the difference between what, what we I throw it in the ignorance category, but it's like, you just didn't know what to do, but how often do people just like, once I start making money in my gym, then I'll buy X, Y, Z thing. And it's always tough. Cause on the opposite side, I'm like, well, it looks like I get the benefit if they buy. So it's tough to overcome that objection. But at the end of the day, I always say there's like four things. They either don't hire you and they, they win. So like even in fitness, right? Like if someone doesn't hire guys as company, they could go figure it out. Maybe. Or they don't hire you and they fail forever. And like that is also a possibility. They could hire you and still fail, right? For fitness, probably not, but they, they technically could. Like something just doesn't work out for them. But at least they have you there to change the plan. Mm -hmm. Like you have support, you have like someone who can help you out. Or like what you experience, you hire someone and you, you have success that you would have never had if you didn't make that decision. And you never right. really know which one it's going to be. But at the end of the day, having a, those people, even if you fail, because a business side, you still could have had something bad happen and failed. People still have tough times in business, but at least you have the core people that are there to help pull you out than just being all alone. And just showed like how different that was. So you did, you did gym launch. When did you guys start having like transitioning away from that and building the online side and seeing success there? Because ob obviously you ran the, do you know who sold you in a gym launch? Who you had the conversation that was, with? That was one of the first. That was one of the <laughs> first of the program, man. So like, that's, that's so how I, 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 like I'm an early adopter. I usually get in when people are just starting so I can get their, I can get their best, you know? Wow, dude. So Alex was the one who actually, I so remember. Maybe sent me, Alex sold me. Yeah, yeah. That was the strategy. That was their, their, I had the script even back in the day because I knew Alex when he started doing that. And I would yeah. refer them people and they would literally like, they were the ones who did the call. So I was like, I have a direct access to Alex. I could just hook you guys up and DM. <laughs> I love it. Come here. Come here, bud. Come say hi. <laughs> Can you say hi? I can't see him, but what's up, buddy? Mid, mid podcast break in. What, say what hi, Kingston. That? You got to at least make this part of like the thumbnail or or a blooper or something. Can you say hi? Hi. What do you want to do? Okay. Can you Speechless. go with mom? Okay. Hey, hey, I'll, I'll help you after. Okay. Go, go, go. Hey, hey, I got to finish this and then we'll go. I love it, dude. Broken, bro. I got a, I got a five-year-old, so I, I love it. Hey, I'll um, help you after. Okay. <laughs> He's so I'll, funny. Dude, I'll tell you, I'll tell you this. Um, I love, I love that by the way. I love when kids do that because there's, as a dad, I'm like, just want to hug them. Right. But it's like, got to go for five more minutes, buddy. <laughs> yeah. 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 I, dude, was, it's, uh, uh, I was just gonna, I was just gonna talk about, um, going through that hormozy process because prior yeah. to that, I was, I was coaching NFL guys, combine guys, world series champions. Like it was all about like strength and conditioning and the performance world. And so gym yeah. launch was like, but that wasn't making me any money. It was like, it was cool. Yeah, gym was launch is like, let's get all the normal people. Exactly. Yeah. And so like, I started getting all the normal people in my gym and it was like, I ultimately was like, ah, I don't know if I, I love this vibe right now. And, and you know, I went general pop. And so I wanted it at a certain point. I'm like, I got to talk to my people. Like, where's like the high performers? Like I want, I want people who love to win, right? I just want people yeah. with desire. And so I started this online version of the program and it was like a different message than, than the gym. And so because I was one of the first people in gym launch, Alex and Layla went out to Deer Valley one time and hit me up and they were like, Hey, you know, we're, you want to have dinner with us. And so me and Nineveh sat with, you know, and this is before they blew up, blew up, but they were, they were at that point, like still, they still had some clout in, in what they created. And so yep. Alex told me, he's like, dude, you can't, you can't be on both sides of the fence. He's like, 
you either go all in on the gym or you either go all in online. What do you want to do? And I'm like, online, I want freedom. He's like, well, then shut the gym down. But at that point, online was like doing about 20K a month and the gym was doing about 20K a month. So in my mind, I'm like, if I shut down the gym, I'm not going to have the revenue. And I, you know, that's half of my stuff. And so for six months, like I fought it. I like literally did not take the advice. I continued to do both, continued to stay stuck. And then three years ago, the COVID thing happened and uh, my gym was forced to shut down. And as soon as it was, like I told my, I told everybody, I'm like, we're never opening back up. Like if you have contract, you can rip it up. I'm going online. You can be grandfathered into this program, but I, I'm like doing it this way. And so like the decision was made for me. And it wasn't that that was like, I, I wasn't a fitness pro that started like making at home workouts for people and changing my messaging around what was going on in the world. I literally acted like it didn't exist. I was just like, we're doing this on the, in, in an online format from here on out. And so immediately, like the 20 grand I made from the gym came over to the online. And from there, I was 100% like congruent in the messaging and the online just started like crushing. So like and I should have so done it six months bro. before, I just couldn't. There's two things in that. One is that if it wasn't for COVID, maybe it would have drawn out even more. So like how, how one person's like curse is like, however way you look at it, someone else could have cl shut down their gym and been like, COVID ruined me. For you, it was like a launch pad and it could have been for them as well. Cause they're, right. the online world is in a respect of persons. If, if you jumped into someone else's body, looked different, smaller, didn't matter, you could still do it again. So it's like, and I'm, I, my first business was online health and fitness and I'm 140 three pounds. So like yeah. it ain't based on six, five or five, seven, none of that. But the other side as well that I, I liked about Hermosi, cause you're the second person. Actually, I had a consult call with a guy that you probably would know. His name is David. And he was one of the first like 17 in gym launch. Well, had a gym and he had the, said that said the same thing that when I, he had talked to Alex, Alex said, you should go online. He's literally telling you guys, don't be my customer anymore. Like how yeah. cool is that? Yeah. You know, it was like, yeah. I just have to give him kudos for that because th this guy said, oh, Alex told me to go online. I had a gym as well. And he told you, Alex at the time only worked with gyms. Yeah. Like it wasn't like he was doing it for a personal gain. So I just thought that that was pretty cool. And then that other side of you twisting that that time, because even right now, bro, I'm, I'm kind of getting not sick and tired, but just a little bit frustrated at the people that are like, oh, guys, the hardest times are ahead. And I'm like, bro, I've been reading your freaking post since 2016. At some point, you may be right. Yeah. But you've been saying it every freaking day since 2016. So at some point, yeah, there may be something hard for someone. So someone will always fit with your content. But I'm kind of getting sick and tired of it because all I know is John went through COVID and launched out online and is doing, shoot, 20 times whatever what you guys ever did before more than that 20x what you ever did before in three years flat and it was only because of this what what do you think and how have you continued to do that because you have ios updates and and ad strategies change and cpms change and all this stuff how are you continuing to do that and, and especially now with like the faith side like that must have been a crazy integration of like now, faith in business, because you were successful before you ever experienced and encountered Jesus or any of this stuff. I know that's a loaded yeah, one, but I'm just like kind of no, fired dude, up. No, it's so this. good. I mean, it, both answers are the same for me. It's it's who are you surrounding yourself with, right? Mm. And so like in business wow. now, like we reached a point where I'm like, dude, we're operating around 5 million bucks. Um, and I'm like, I don't like everyone's telling me how great that is in, in the fitness industry. And I, and, and I started comparing myself to a bunch of people who were doing much less than that. So I'm like, oh, I'm awesome. And, uh, then I realized how, you know, how that, like I'm comparing myself to the wrong, to the wrong people. Right. And mm -hmm. so through the wellspring, we meet, you know, Brandon and Kaylin and I'm like, you guys, now you guys, I will like, you are the perfect coach for me. So it's like change, like changing who I'm surrounding myself with and getting the right counsel. So I've been like, I feel like I've been stuck for like 12 months and I'm operating at the edge of my understanding of like what the next move is. So I need somebody with a higher vantage point that has a, that has a further vision for me. 
And it's like, mm -hmm. so they can cast the vision and tell me what the next step is and the next step. I'm like, that's how I break through. And so same thing in faith, it was, you know, if it wasn't for those people who were just placed in my life at the perfect time, then the example that I needed might not have been there. And so with the, with like the Wellspring group and, and you and your wife and, you know, everybody, I, I, I can't help but to think of, you know, the passage of, of, you know, the seed, which is like, sometimes like if the sun's too hot, it's going to scorch the seed or there's going to be birds fly by and it's going to scorch the seed. It's like what I'm doing in my faith is like, I'm taking root because I've created a whole new circle around people who are kingdom people who I respect immensely, not only uh, for their businesses, but their faith and how they live their lives. And so it's like inserting myself in that environment then, then gives me, gives me deeper roots. And so um, in faith, that's been a, a beautiful thing, but I've done that in business since 2016. I would say that that's the number one thing that I've done. I've invested into the right mentors, no matter how much it costs in time or money or energy, because I need, I need that uh, environment to just let me take root. And so the question was like kind of two sides to the question, but it, to me, it's the same answer. It's like, always surround yourself with people who can cast a higher vision, farther vision and, and get that supporting cast. Because if you do that, man, like, I just believe that that's the winning, that that's actually the winning equation for, for anything. Yeah, there's a stat that 97% of people by the age of 65 are either dead or dead broke relying on their friends, family, and government for their main source of income. Mm -hmm. When I looked at you when you came out of football and you had 330 grand, you went through almost that same trying time at 5 million, which is totally different yearly. And, and it was like at that time you compared yourself to everyone who was lower than you as well when there was plenty of people you could have compared yourself to they were higher. They're harder to find, right? I come from middle class city, like lower middle class. I grew up in like a 1300 square foot house. So it wasn't like I, you know, I remember the first time I rode in a BMW and I was like, bro, like this is crazy, right? Like a regular three series, probably 328i, like nothing crazy. But to me, I was like, bro, this is baller. So I didn't really have the examples, but for you, you compared yourself to those lower people, didn't make those investments. They were harder to find than they are now. You didn't have social, you didn't have all this stuff. And then you're at 5 million, you were able to look at again, well, the people I'm around, I'm doing really good. Like everyone's singing my praises. But then you chose to take that next route, which is like that, not even 3%, that's like the 0.1%. Because the 3% just don't rely on their friends, family, and government for the main source of income. That doesn't mean that they're prospering. So I just think that mm -hmm. that's so cool and, and something for everyone to look at. And how those investments have continued to grow as well. Working with Brandon Kalen is not a small investment. But gym launch neither was at the beginning either. That was like actually probably percentage-wise way crazier of an investment for you guys to make at the time. But you've continued to just stretch yourself. And uh, success leaves clues. And for, for every guy and, and woman out there, it's like, look at what John's doing. Like, And if you truly want it or take it as a, what, what do you say to people that maybe they, they hear this, but they're still afraid? They're still just not making that decision. Do you tell them just to quit or like, what? If they're still like, oh man, I, I hear it, but like, you know, I, it's, maybe it won't work for me. Yeah. Yeah, man. I mean, there, there's doubt, right? And I think that there's, if I, if I look back at my life, there's been multiple times where I've, where I've had that doubt in moments, right? It's an emotion that we feel. So I can still, like, I can still uh, have a fleeting moment of doubt now. And there's multiple times I do. I'm like, man, could I really do what Brandon and Kaylin did? Right? Or could I, like, I have these dreams that are very big. I'm like, could I really actually do that? And so there's sometimes moments I have to, I have to sit with that for a second, right? And kind of explore it. But um, on the other side of doubt, there's courage, right? And so I think that what holds most people back is, even though they're like, man, I can't do it. Or it's like this, it's like, that's still like, they're still as uncomfortable as that is for them. They're still comfortable enough not to, not to make the decision. Right. So mm. they're comfortable making 10 grand a month or they're comfortable, like however painful, like I would perceive it to be like, that's their comfort zone and, and they're stuck in it. So for me, um, 
I want to put myself in the most uncomfortable situations because comfort is, is the thing that keeps me stagnant. Right. And so like now, like I might have doubt, but the courage on the flip side of that is this willingness to take whatever risk necessary. It's like, I'm in the arena, no matter what happens, like I can live with myself if it doesn't work out. I can't live with myself if I don't take the shot. And so what I see with a lot of other people is they're willing to live with themselves because they're not, maybe they're not gonna win big, but they also know where, you know, where they're at is like, that's just gonna be the way that life is and they're okay with that. That's just not okay with me. And so it's just the perspective that I've been able to build within myself. And I wish I could like just give people that extra whatever it is to just bet on themselves one time, right? Because whether they succeed that one time or like don't succeed, the learning that they're gonna take from it is gonna be the, it's probably gonna be the next breadcrumb. It's gonna lead to the next person. It's gonna lead to the next opportunity. It's gonna keep leading to the next thing. It's like the ultimate growth mindset, which to me is like the ultimate faith, right? It's like faith is the way. You gotta have faith in your creator. You have to have faith in yourself and you have to have faith in the people that you choose to surround yourself with, right? And I think a lot of people miss that. It's like, they wanna know the answers before there is any answers. I always say like, I, I heard an analogy, I think it was John Maxwell, it's like, he's like, you're sitting in a car and it's pitch black and there's no moon and there's no stars, right? You turn on your headlights and all you can see is however many yards ahead where those where those headlights go to. You can't see miles long, right? And so what some people do is like they put their high beams on and maybe it goes out a little bit wider and a little bit further. But ultimately what people will sit there and do is they sit in their car because they're like, man, I can't, I can't see past the turn, right? I can't see past the turn. But what you gotta do is you gotta get the car out of park and put it in drive because the path will reveal itself only as you move and step. And so you have to step and drive in faith and people are stuck because they want all the answers first. Dude, I didn't have all the answers to get to the National Football League. Had no answer. Like, in fact, I went, veered off the path and didn't play football. Same thing in business is like, I didn't have the exact game plan of how I got from, you know, broke to here. Although I did keep walking and stepping in faith some moments were painful, but everything was a breadcrumb just revealing itself as I went along. And so it's just like, I, I have to live like that, man. And sometimes it's hard, but you know, if you're, if anybody's on the fence, like think about that analogy, like you've got to get out of park, you've got to put it in drive. Yeah. You can't steer a parked car. If you're not in motion, you even make a change to the steering wheel. You ain't going anywhere different. And yeah. man, it's just, it's cool to hear your story from literal going back to zero to building up gradually gym a little bit online to then just having this massive hockey stick growth and if anything i hope this episode really gives people that one that confidence that you talked about that can be absorbed through the conversation but also just that in inspiration where you know you're not selling everyone your program i'm not selling everyone my program here i hope that they buy them all by the way but that's not what we're doing the the thing is is like they should have this that thing that kind of inspires them to take that next step. You know, it's like you're never going to build a billion dollar dream when you're, t when you're scared to make a $5,000 investment, like it just ain't going to happen. Like it should just be, show you that it's not, <laughs> you don't really believe in, in what you're building and in, in your actual skill set. So dude, I just think this was awesome, man. Thank you so much for, for investing time with us. I know that you had talked about your podcast a little bit earlier. They can follow you. Your Instagram's just John Madsen, right? Name on Instagram. Yeah, John Madsen official on Instagram and podcast is the show with John Madsen on all the platforms. So good, bro. Thanks so much again. Thank you for having me, man.